Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention, please. My name is Rob Havers, the president of the George C. Marshall Foundation. A very warm welcome to you all on what is a, a lovely evening. This is a very special presentation, the latest in what has been an infrequent presentation of the Francis McNulty Logan Lewis Lecture. A lecture series endowed by George Logan in honor of his mother, Francis McNulty Logan. As you hopefully read in your invitations, Francis grew up here in Lexington and indeed on post at BMI in a house that sat where Moody Hall now sits today. We are very delighted this evening to have with us George and his wife Harmon. We honor us with your presence, thank you. Tonight's speaker is author and journalist Jason Pagone, currently an investigative reporter on the staff of the San Francisco Chronicle. Jason, the author of three other non-fiction books, was drawn to this topic in 2013 on the back of a fiore around Edward Snowden. This led Jason to the NSA and the father of the NSA, William Friedman. By extension, to Elizabeth Smith Friedman, and we are delighted to say, led him down the road to Lexington, Virginia, to the papers of the Friedmans and the George C. Marshall Foundation. The rest, as they say, is history, and a very fine book is what followed. We are in for a treat this evening. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Jason again. Can you hear me okay? okay. Uh, hopefully this is the only slide that didn't make the PowerPoint conversion correctly, but I, that quote is supposed to read, uh, if I can capture a goodly number of your messages, even if I don't have your code book, I can still read your thoughts. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I am really honored to be here. Um, I, uh, to give you a sense of where I'm coming from and, and my journey here, I, uh, I'm a journalist. I have spent my entire career writing about um, people usually carrying a notepad or a, a recorder, writing about the living. Um, and uh, this was my first experience sort of really investing and going deep into uh, archival research in a special collection. I'm a little embarrassed to say I think I'm, I'm so glad to see Paul here because we had a conversation about this once, but uh, I, I think I sort of understood abstractly that there's a lot of information in the world that is not on Google, um, <laughs> but I don't think I, I actually really understood that in any kind of tactile, uh, reality-based way until I came here. Um, so, uh, so this library is very special to me. Uh, it's a very special place, not only because, obviously, uh, the book that I wrote wouldn't have been possible without this place because this is the home of the Friedman archive, both William and Elizabeth, but it's also very special to me because it showed me a new direction in my career and um, got me uh, interested and obsessed in archival research. And I just wanted to take a second to say thank you to the people here who, uh, who helped make that happen. Uh, thanks to Rob, uh, who was always very friendly and encouraging uh, whenever I would show up here. and. Um, I wanted to thank Paul, who uh, uh, was immediately friendly when he first met me, uh, even though he didn't know me from Adam. Uh, Jeffrey Kozak was uh, uh, constantly helpful and uh, uh, a continual sort of calming presence. And uh, uh, thank you to uh, George and Harmon for your uh, support of this program. I, I, I am uh, honored to be the recipient of your generosity. And um, I wanted to thank Kirsten Hancock, who is in the back there, who is a researcher on the book uh, and uh, dug up a lot of uh, uh, really important information, sort of some of the coolest uh, bones that are part of the skeleton of the story. Did I miss anyone? In that's, that's good? OK. All right. <laughs> if I missed somebody, I'm sorry. Um, OK. so. Uh, 
And I just wanted to put a, a little bug in your ear before I launch in. This is, this is in a lot of ways, a, a book about libraries. Um, the Freedmen's one way of looking at them is that they themselves were archivists. Um, the intelligence community is, in one sense, a giant archive of secret information. And um, uh, J. Edgar Hoover actually got his start in his career as a librarian at the uh, Library of Congress. And in the story of the Freedmen's, you see that libraries become um, mysterious and wondrous places, and sometimes they even become weapons. All right, so this is where, this is where I began. Uh, this is here in the Marshall Library. Um, I, uh, like Rob said, I, I started getting interested in the Freedmen's in 2013 after the Edward Snowden story broke. I, um, I, I read about the NSA. I think like a lot of Americans, I didn't really know that much about the NSA. And uh, when you read about the NSA, all roads lead back to William F. Friedman. He's considered to be the, the founder of the NSA, the godfather, or whatever you want to call it. If you go to NSA headquarters in Fort Meade, there's a giant bronze bust of his head outside of the auditorium that's named for him. And, um, and I was reading all of this about William Friedman, and, uh, uh, and I, I read about William Friedman that he had a wife who, like William Friedman, was a code breaker. It was somebody whose expertise was in solving secret messages without knowing the key. Uh, so William Friedman, this famous code breaker, had a, a code breaking wife. And I, th I thought it was interesting, how many husband and wife code breakers can there be? Uh, it, it turns out there's really only you know, one or maybe two meaningful pairs, but William and Elizabeth are the most, uh, most important. So um, I, I happened to see online that Elizabeth had left her collection here, and so one day I, I drove down here, I, I got the friendly welcome, and uh, uh, Jeffrey led me back into the vault here and showed me the Elizabeth Smith Friedman collection, which is 22 boxes that Elizabeth left here uh, before she died. And um, it's an incredible archive. You, when, you, when you go into this, these boxes, you can read uh, letters from 100 years ago. You can read her college diary is there, her uh, original poems that she wrote because she was a poet, um, original code worksheets, letters that she wrote to her children in code. Um, uh, she and William taught their daughter how to use a cipher, and so her daughter, when she was eight or nine, would use this cipher to write letters to them from camp. Um, uh, but there's just an incredible texture to it, and I quickly realized reading, reading through these letters in these boxes that um, this is essentially what every journalist's dream is, to stumble into something like this, to stumble into a story that feels really big and cool and feels like it has not been told. And... Um, what was the story that started to unfold here? It was a story about a hidden woman behind the development of the American intelligence community in the 20th century. There was a genius, a woman, named Elizabeth Smith Friedman, who solved all kinds of puzzles and fixed all kinds of messes. And uh, she became one of the greatest code breakers of all time. Um, and yet she didn't set out to be a code breaker, which was one of the things that first grabbed me. So very quickly through her early life, uh, uh, she was born in Indiana. She was born into a big family. She, she didn't like her family that much. Uh, uh, her, she, she was the ninth of nine siblings, and she could really take them or leave them. Um, she just kind of wanted to get out. That was her, that was her, main, uh, her main goal. She, she even hated her name. She was born uh, Smith. And uh, in, in the diary that she left here, there's an incredible line uh, to give you a sense of just kind of how spunky she was at age 21. She wrote in this diary, it seems that when I'm introduced to a stranger by this most meaningless of phrases, plain Miss Smith, that I shall be forever in that stranger's estimation, eliminated from any category, even approaching anything interesting or at all uncommon. Right? Okay, so this is somebody who was very ambitious and wanted to get out. Uh, she wanted something more. So in 1916, in the middle of World War I, she was a school teacher. She didn't like being a school teacher in Indiana, and she quit her job. She went to the big city, to Chicago, and uh, she went to a library there just because she um, had always loved literature. She had studied literature. She was a uh, fan of Shakespeare, Tennyson, and she had read that this library in Chicago, a private library for rich people called the Newberry Library, happened to have a copy of uh, Shakespeare's first folio, which was the first printing of all of Shakespeare's plays in one place, 1623. It was a very rare book. And she wanted to see it because she had read about it, but she'd never seen one in person. So she goes to this library, and um, she happens to 
uh, uh, get connected at this library, she meets a, a crazy rich person of the time named George Fabian. Uh, we can call him crazy today. It would have been dangerous to call him crazy to his face uh, in 1916 or 1917, but he, um, he was this, he was everything that she was not. She was petite, she was five foot three. George Fabian was this very large, kind of aggressive, uh, six foot four, uh, 240 pounds, big iron gray beard. So she walks into this library and she's looking for work and uh, she falls into a conversation with a librarian and the librarian says, um, it looks like you're interested in Shakespeare. Do you like Shakespeare? And she says, yes. And the librarian says, uh, well, it's the funny thing. There's this, there's this odd rich fellow who keeps coming to the library uh, who, who has been looking at the same book, and he thinks that there are secret messages embedded in the Shakespeare First Folio uh, that actually prove that Shakespeare wasn't Shakespeare, that somebody else wrote Shakespeare and not Shakespeare. Uh, uh, and he said, this crazy rich fellow, uh, that he uh, was looking for a research assistant. Would you be interested in work like that? She said, sure, whatever. And then the librarian went back to the desk and made a phone call came back and said, uh, Mr. Fabian will be here to pick you up. And uh, she's absolutely amazed. She had no intention this would happen. And within, the, within about an hour, George Fabian pulled up to the library in his limousine. Um, and the story is, she told this many times throughout her life. The story is that he walked into the library and he walked up to her and the first thing he said to her was, would you like to come out to Riverbank and spend the night with me? <laughs> and. Uh, you know, she's 23, she's from a Quaker family, fairly devout, and this is a scandalous thing to say to somebody in that, in that era. Probably even, even today, that's a scandalous thing to say. And so she stammered something, she said, well, I don't have my pajamas, or I don't have a toothbrush or something. And, um, and uh, George Fabian said, well, that's all right, we'll provide everything, come on. And then he grabbed her by the arm and, um, and led her out to the limousine, and uh, that's how she began working for him at this place that she had never heard of before called Riverbank. This is George Fabian. Um, he, he, Riverbank was kind of like half a rich person's paradise in the Gilded Age and half a scientific laboratory. Uh, Fabian was much like Andrew Carnegie or William Randolph Hearst, um, you know, a, a business tycoon of the Gilded Age who had all, enough money to essentially build his own kingdom and make up his own rules. And the difference between Fabian and, and all of the other Gilded Age uh, rich guys was that whereas somebody like Carnegie or Hearst would collect paintings or sculptures, George Fabian was really fascinated with uh, the secrets of nature and with science. And even though he was a high school dropout, he fancied himself a funder and a, a benefactor of science. He wanted to discover the secrets of nature. His main obsession was actually figuring out uh, how to live forever. He believed that science could discover the secret to immortality. But he was also obsessed with Shakespeare. He believed that these secret messages were really embedded in, in the book. Uh, and he wanted to find them. So he brings Elizabeth out, and she joins this group of uh, Shakespeare scholars that Fabian had assembled at this place, Riverbank. Um, uh, the woman on the, uh, that's Elizabeth sort of in the center, uh, leaning down a little bit. And the woman on the far left sitting is the woman who was her direct boss at Riverbank, a woman named Elizabeth Wells Gallup. I don't really have time to get into Elizabeth Wells Gallup, but it's a, kind of a fascinating story there in, in and of itself. Anyway, she, she's brought, um, all of a sudden, from Chicago to a rich man's paradise, she's told that she is going to now help uh, this rich man and his hand-selected team uh, discover the true secret of Shakespeare, which is that Shakespeare is not really Shakespeare. They're all going to get rich and famous, and they're going to rewrite the history of the English language together. She's 23 years old. Um, and the problem is that it is all a delusion. It is uh, not true by our all available best evidence. I don't know if there are any Baconians in the audience tonight. Uh, but um, uh, the system actually doesn't work. It was, it was based on sort of trying to discern very fine uh, uh, divisions, very subtle distinctions between different fonts on the page. And there's no evidence that this was actually achievable. So it's all a wild goose chase, but in the course of sort of pursuing this wild goose chase, something incredible happens, which is that Elizabeth, meets uh, uh, the love of her life. This is William Friedman. And um, this is kind of a classic American thing. Two people from completely different worlds, you know, by both of their families, they're not supposed to be together. And yet they have such a bond and such a connection that they kind of overcome all of these obstacles so that they can be together. Um, I, have a, I have a theory. I can't 
necessarily prove it. But my theory is that, have you ever been in a workplace where you felt like you were the only sane person there? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that there were two people who felt that way at Riverbank, and that they found each other, and that they liked each other, and that that's what bonded them together. Uh, this was one of this was one of the moments when when I when I was here I was sitting at the table upstairs in the research library I knew that I was going to be spending uh, the next however many months or years of my life on this project was when I found some of their love, early love letters that they wrote to each other and um, and they wrote them in code they would they would sign off these little terms of endearment endearment at the bottom this is what's called a rail fence cipher. Uh, you you start at the bottom left and you read up and then down and up kind of a, a snake like form. It's not a complicated thing, but it, I, I always found it very cute. But more than that, uh, to me, it was evidence of, of their bond and their connection. Um, and when they started to write about the true science of code breaking, when they started to investigate it together, to go beyond this delusion and discover, well, what are some ways that you could really find messages that actually are there? And what are some ways you could do that in a rigorous fashion, scientific fashion? When they wrote about their methods, they wrote about doing it together. Um, a group of two operators working harmoniously as a unit can accomplish more than four operators working singly. Different minds centered on the same problem will supplement and check each other. Arrows will be find, found quickly. Interchange. It's not letting me scroll. That's all right. Anyway, they were very good. The point here is they were very good individually, but they were even better together. Um, and they were doing this at a time when uh, a new discipline was being born, radio intelligence. So um, this is kind of the dawn of radio as a widespread technology, and it changed everything in the science of codes and ciphers because all of a sudden, with radio, you had a world of information that was flying through the air. And with radio signals, they could be intercepted by anyone. It was like you know, scooping a, uh, a piece of a river with a cup. Uh, anyone with an antenna could uh, intercept a, a, a radio message. Radio messages were sent in uh, uh, the dots and dashes of Morse code. And now, because anybody could intercept a radio message, the, the Morse code couldn't be in English. It couldn't be in plain text. If you wanted to send a message that was useful or sensitive, you had to encrypt it. So all of a sudden, there was a huge, a huge premium on cryptography, on ways of encrypting, ways of keeping secret. Uh, messages, that, these messages that were flying through the air. And at the same time, it created a, a huge des desire and demand premium for code breakers, for people who could solve those messages without knowing the key. And at this time, America was terrible at it. Uh, this is a, one of the surprising things to me, uh, was that in 1916, when Elizabeth and William started doing this, uh, there, Elizabeth always said there were maybe four or five people in the entire country who really even knew what the word code or cipher meant. Uh, there was no NSA then, there was no CIA, and the FBI was, I think, eight years old. So America really had no one who knew how to solve the secret messages of a potential enemy, and this became a problem in 1917 when America entered World, World War I. All of a sudden, there's all this secret information flying around the radio that you can intercept it, but you can't read it. Um, there's nobody available to do that. Except these people. <laughs> these are the only people in the country at the time who really are equipped to, to read the secret messages of Germany in 1917. This is incredible. You're looking at a photo of essentially the early National Security Agency here. <laughs> so uh, all of a sudden, this quixotic literary project of finding secret messages in Shakespeare uh, becomes an issue of national security. The army doesn't have any code breakers. They need code breakers. And so even though the army thinks that George Fabian is kind of a lunatic, uh, and they're correct in thinking that, they, they need him. And so they go to George Fabian, and they say, will you lend us your code breakers for the duration of the war? George Fabian says yes. And this is how Elizabeth and William uh, begin to solve military messages and to uh, begin to invent uh, in their 20s, in the uh, Illinois Prairie, pretty much isolated from the rest of the world, they begin to invent the modern science of codes and ciphers that still is at the base of our intelligence agencies today. This is an incredible thing to me. Um, I think part of it is that they just didn't know what was supposed to be possible. 
because they were so young and because they were in the middle of nowhere. But uh, the fact is, over the next couple of years, they, they collaborated, I would argue, on, on many of what are no, today no, now known as the Riverbank publications, which are upstairs the original copies in the library. Uh, these have always been attributed to William, but uh, I, I, in the research for this book, I, uh, I went to the original drafts of the Riverbank papers, which are contained in the uh, New York Public Library. And the original drafts uh, credit many of the passages to Elizabeth. And not just the historical passages, but uh, technical passages too. And it's, it's very cool when you go there, when you look at the drafts, you can actually see both of their handwriting. So that's Elizabeth's handwriting in the left margin and William's very distinctive handwriting on the bottom. And so you can see them writing these things together and editing each other. And to me, the, the deal sealer is, this is from the, the Marshall Library. Uh, this is William's personal copy of one of the Riverbank publications. And he wrote, even though Elizabeth was never credited uh, during her life for being a co-author of this, William wrote her in as a co-author. So long story short, um, Fabian becomes erratic. They have to, he, he starts to spy on them to intercept their mail. Uh, there's some hint that he sexually <coughs> harassed Elizabeth while William was off in France. Um, they were unhappy about it. And eventually they have to escape Riverbank in the middle of the night, Elizabeth says, so that we don't, we don't get our necks cut. Um, and uh, in 1920, they both, they both get up and leave. They light out to Washington, D.C. to begin a, a new life together. They both get jobs with, uh, after the war with uh, the U.S. military. And William goes to work for the Army, which he will continue to work for until his retirement. And, um, and Elizabeth initially goes to work for the Army, but pretty soon after that quits because she doesn't like working for the government. It's not her thing. She would rather uh, stay home and write children's books. That was really her ambition. She wanted to be a... Uh, archaeologist, uh, a popularizer of science. She wanted to write for children uh, to share her passion for the alphabet, the history of language uh, with young people. So, uh, and she, she had the, the Freedman's first child around that time too, uh, Barbara in 1923. So in 1925, um, Elizabeth is at home writing children's books, taking care of their first kid. And she's not working for the government, and she thinks that this is going to be her life, and she's happy with that. She doesn't want to have anything to do with the government. The problem is that in 1925, a man from the government shows up on Elizabeth's door and asks her to solve some puzzles. And this is her perpetual complaint, uh, uh, by the way, about the government. Is that she said, this is a direct quote from her, men from the government are always showing up on my door asking me to do things for America, and they won't leave until I actually solve these puzzles. <laughs> Uh, but the problem is that she was just too good. She was too good at what she did. She was indispensable. There weren't that many code breakers who could do what she could do at the time. Um, and the guy who showed up and asked for this help was a guy from the Coast Guard, a guy named Charles Root. And the Coast Guard had a problem. Uh, the rum trade. They, they, uh, the rum runners were running circles around them, uh, partly because the Coast Guard was corrupt and, and the Coast Guard was underfunded and they didn't have enough boats, but also because uh, the rum runners had a lot of money to buy radio equipment, and some of them even hired um, British naval cryptographers to help them set up systems of codes that were very impressive and very secure. Um, so they would have a shortwave radio on a boat, and then they would have a pirate radio station on the shore, and they would communicate uh, between the boats and the pirate radio station on the shore, and in this way they would be able to set up drop points, and they would be able to unload all this liquor uh, under the cover of night without the Coast Guard ever being able to do anything about it. Um, it was a real mismatch. And the Coast Guard did have one asset is in, in that they had all these listening stations uh, along the coast so that they could rescue uh, boats that were stuck in storms uh, for SOS calls. So they could intercept the messages, but they couldn't read them because they didn't have any code breakers until Elizabeth stepped in. So uh, <laughs> this, this is, a, I think this is a, a note that would be clipped to the, basically what she would do is she would leave her home and she would go down to the treasury building in DC and they would ha literally hand her like a manila envelope and would have one of these things clipped on it. You know, Mrs. Friedman, please see what you can do with this and return it to us. <laughs> and, uh, and then she would take it home and she would solve all the puzzles inside and then a week later she would come back and she would say, here, here you go. And then they would give her another envelope and <laughs> she, just, she couldn't ever escape this, uh, 
uh, this problem of, of additional envelopes. Um, she was too good at her job. She was too good at her job. She saw massive amounts of these, uh, these raw messages, by the way. The, just to give you a sense, um, uh, 2,000 messages per month, essentially alone. All she had uh, during these years, during the 1920s, was a, a single clerk typist helping her. Um, 25,000 messages per year. And in case you have um, some image of bootleggers from that time as being like gentlemen, uh, I, this is maybe a little bit of a dangerous thing to say in this part of the country. Uh, <laughs> but um, I'm not talking about like moonshiners here. I'm talking about um, international criminal syndicates that ran armadas of ships. Um, my, my, my image of these guys had always been that they kind of like they were out for the love of the sea and the surf. But uh, that's not true. It was actually the mafia uh, starting in around uh, 1925 or 1926. There were some of those guys in, in the beginning, but the mafia edged them all out of business. So that's what Elizabeth was taking on. She was taking on um, international criminal syndicates that had as many as 50 or 60 ships, depending on the company. So for the first time, you could actually, because she was able to break these codes, um, sometimes the messages would have exact latitude and longitude coordinates of where the boats were going to be. So she was able to uh, track them and, uh, and start to uh, intercept the boats at, the, at these drop points. This is one of my favorite messages in the collection here, uh, because to me it shows that, uh, uh, that she was getting the best of these guys and that they had no idea what was going on. Uh, this message essentially says, uh, uh, there's a leak someplace. Our, op our, our guys have been arrested and we don't know what's happening. Um, and he, he, I think he's assuming that somebody has ratted him out. Somebody in his own crew has ratted out uh, the, the location of the alcohol exchange. They, they had no idea that there was this woman sitting in a, a Coast Guard office in Washington reading every word that they said. Um, uh, what I would really suggest to you that she was doing is an early form of counterintelligence. She was using uh, her power over radio to, and her code breaking abilities to do counterintelligence, which is trying to get inside uh, an enemy network to try to understand who is talking to whom and how that network operates. It's the same principle that underlies doing counterintelligence on sort of Russian spies today or uh, Chinese spies. Um, you try to figure out who is talking to whom and, 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 uh, and the structure of their network, and you try to light it up by finding out as much information as you can. She, was, uh, she became an expert at lighting up these uh, darkened networks. Um, and she started to learn a couple of things about these, uh, uh, about these characters. The, the guy in the middle is, I don't have time to talk about this, but I'm happy to talk about this after if, if you're curious about it. It's a guy named Kid Can. He was essentially the Al Capone of uh, Minneapolis St. Paul. I never knew there was an Al Capone of Minneapolis St. Paul, but there was, and uh, she, she made his life pretty difficult. Uh, this is just to give you a sense of the scope of these uh, rum rings at the time. This is, this is one uh, criminal syndicate that Elizabeth tracked, uh, and this is just their boats that are operating on the West Coast. This is based in Vancouver. It was called the Consolidated Exporters Corporation. And one of the investors was Joseph Kennedy, who was the father of John F. Kennedy. All right. So, uh, so <laughs> uh, Elizabeth was getting close to some fairly, fairly powerful uh, individuals. And, and this is the map that she drew of their uh, radio network on the West Coast at the time. You know, they had 60 ships. Some of these ships were basically like floating uh, Walmarts full of booze. Um, OK. Uh, so she did all of this alone until. Uh, until 1931, and she finally said, look, I need, some, I need a team. I want to create a team. I want to be a boss. And so she wrote this memo. Uh, she said, I want a team. And because she was so in indispensable, despite the sexism uh, of, of the culture at the time and sexism of US government, um, the Coast Guard did this incredible thing, and they gave her the team that she wanted. So she, she instantly became, um, almost instantly, uh, you know, one of the first technical bosses, intelligence bosses in American history. She was given uh, 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 funds to hire about six people. And she gave herself a really cool title uh, as boss. She called herself cryptanalyst in charge. <laughs> and and in, some, in, some ways, um, in some ways, she was kind of a, a pure co a code breaker than William. There, there's a lot of debate about who was the better code breaker. Was it William or Elizabeth? Again, we can talk about that. Um, you know, Elizabeth always said that they, they were a team. They, were, they started equally at the same time. William always insisted that she was better than him. Um, and, uh, but I think that Elizabeth, in a lot of ways, was the pure code breaker because there's a story, famous story about 
one time when someone from the military walked into her Coast Guard office and they needed some kind of code created. They, need a, they needed a secure code made from scratch. And she told them to go to hell, and she said, uh, uh, we don't make them, we only break them. <laughs> All right. So, um, so prohibition ends, and Elizabeth adapts. She, she, she applies the, uh, these counterintelligence techniques, doing the same thing, intercepting radio messages, decrypting them, lighting up the darkened network to go after opium gangs globally. Uh, and these cases are very, are very dramatic, and they make her famous uh, for a brief time in the 1930s. This is from uh, a magazine at the time, True Detection, uh, Detective Fiction Weekly. Um, I love that phrase. Small, a, a small, slender American woman stepped in and smashed crime where men had failed. <laughs> um, she absolutely hated this kind of thing, by the way. She could, she could not stand it. Um, she, uh, she hated it because, fundamentally, she was a modest person. Uh, she hated it because she hated journalists. She thought that journalists were uh, uh, and, and a much more inaccurate and uh, kind of loose with facts kind of tribe than scientists, which she was. And she also hated it because when she would get uh, coverage like this, it would make her male colleagues jealous. And she would have to, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of letters upstairs where it's basically just Elizabeth apologizing to male colleagues who weren't written about in these articles saying, oh, my dear Inspector Fish, I'm so sorry. The American press is terrible. <laughs> you know? um, but unfortunately for Elizabeth, she really was an amazing story. She really was, I mean, there was this, this uh, American, house, you know, American housewife, mother of two children, would leave, leave her home on a Friday, um, you know, and she would go to a, a trial. She, she wasn't just staying in the Coast Guard office. This is part of what made her famous. Is she, would, she would be called to testify in front of juries um, to explain how these codes had been broken. It wasn't enough for the prosecutors to just uh, uh, go to the jury and say, uh, we, we, you know, we spied on these uh, bootleggers. We know what they say. No, they had to bring in Elizabeth and say, well, here's the science of code breaking. Here's how I intercepted the radio messages. Here's how I broke them. And here's why this is science. And here's how you, you can know that what we're saying these guys said, they actually said. And so there are all these newspaper articles from the 1930s where Elizabeth is walking. You know, they're depicting Elizabeth walking into a courtroom, uh, this you know, five foot three, five foot four woman in a you know, pink hat with a flower pinned to the brim, <laughs> carrying her bag up to the uh, jury, you know, up to the um, testimony box. And she's facing down, you know, some of the most fearsome gangsters of her day. I mean, it's an incredible story. Um, and, and also some of the coverage was, was kind of, it was simultaneously celebratory and condescending. Um, the tone of it was almost like, um, you know, we know that men have brains. But did you know that women also have brains? <laughs> um, solved by one. Okay. Um, okay. So everything I've told you about so far uh, can be found in the collection here. There was one big unanswered question when I started the research, which is, what was Elizabeth doing during World War II? And uh, I don't think the answer was was really known. I I, I looked around. I, I couldn't find anything. I talked to people. They said that um, that nobody really knew. You know, Elizabeth's archive goes up until about 1938, and then it stops, and then it picks up again in about 1946, 1947. And so, you know, for a journalist, what is that gap doing there, right? What, what was she doing? She must have been doing something. You know, the, the, one, of the, one of America's best code breakers all of a sudden just sits out the greatest global conflict of the century so far. It, it didn't seem plausible. Um, and... Uh, I talked to some people who said that maybe those records were in the National Archives. Uh, and if that were the case, I should probably just abandon hope. Because this is the National Archives. <laughs> this is the last scene in Indiana Jones and the uh, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay? So, so they find the Ark, they wheel the Ark, you know, they put it in a box, and they wheel it into a giant government warehouse. It looks identical to 10,000 other boxes. Implication is you will never find the Ark. It's going to be lost for history again. And this is, this is actually what the National Archives is like. I don't know if any of you have ever, ever done research there. It's not digitized. Um, but after about a year and a half of research there, I found this. And this was the key to unlocking it all. This is the 329-page technical history 
of Elizabeth's Coast Guard diary during World War II. So the day I found this was one of the best days of my career. <laughs> and it was, uh, and I really had to suppress an urge to like holler for joy <laughs> in the National Archives, which you can't do because there are a lot of people there doing research, genealogical research on their families, and they, and they will not treat you kindly if you, if you interrupt them in any way. <laughs> but uh, but that, was, that was a really cool moment, I, you know, because this is, this is online now, by the way. I uploaded this, so anybody can uh, page through this and, and take a look. Uh, every page of it is stamped Top Secret Ultra, which is one reason it was... Uh, uh, secret for so long. It was only declassified, I think, in about 2000. So um, this is actually the most spectacular part of the story. And it's the part that wasn't known uh, until recently. And I can tell you that now, but I think I'm, I think I'm running low on time. So I could, also, I could also sort of, I could accelerate to the end <laughs> and answer questions. Um, I'm not quite sure what to do. I think I will accelerate because I think probably a lot of you will have questions. Um, but let me get to let me get to a couple of. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll try to do it fast. I'll try to do it really fast. Okay, all right. I'm like terrified of losing people's attention because I always hate that in a talk. It's like I. I all right, okay. All right, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, <laughs> I'll try to do this really fast. Okay, so um, uh, uh, 1939, uh, the Nazis start sending spies into the Western Hemisphere. And they send them into a, a really good place for uh, Germany to send spies, which is South America. Because it's close to North America, it's kind of a listening post. They can, they can watch Allied ships come and go. And there's also a lot of natural um, fascist sympathy in South America already. This isn't a photo of Nazi brown shirts. This is a photo of uh, Brazilian green shirts. Uh, local Brazilian fascist movement at the time. So there was some kismet there. J. Edgar Hoover uh, wanted to be the hero, and he went to the president. He said, I, I want the FBI to have authority to try to go into South America, which it didn't have the authority at the time, but he wanted the authority to go into South America and um, try to round up these Nazi spy networks. The problem for uh, the FBI is that they weren't very good at it. There's a famous story. They, they trained some guys in 1940, and they started to send them into South America. And there's a, there's a story about a guy who trained uh, to go to a post in, in uh, Brazil. And in New York, they, they taught him uh, an intensive Spanish language class. <laughs> and he got off of the plane in Brazil, you know, somewhat disappointed to see that Spanish is not the native language of, of Brazil. <laughs> he learned the wrong language. Um, you know, they got off the plane, and they, they didn't have tans. You know, they looked like FBI guys. They had the, you know the square jaw and everything, and the, the, the snap brim hat, and, and everybody kind of made them for FBI guys immediately. Um, what the Nazis were doing is they, they were setting up clandestine radio stations across South America. They were doing the things that the Rum Runners had done, they, setting up pirate radio, communicating by clandestine radio, and communicating with um, encryption, with codes. So the only way that these Nazi spies were going to be rounded up was if the FBI could get access somehow to a team of code breakers that was able to intercept these Nazi radio messages, break the codes, and tell the FBI what they were saying. The FBI didn't have anything like that. All they had was a technical laboratory, which was really just a crime lab for analyzing fingerprints and bullets and that kind of thing. They, they didn't have the code breaking expertise. But, but Elizabeth did. Cryptanalyst in charge, right? She created her own team. And they had been practicing for 10 years, at least, on these rum runners. They had been getting really good at it lighting up these darkened networks using, using intercepts of radio messages and code breaking. So, um, so she went in and started to do it. I don't have time to get into the details of all of the codes that she broke, but um, this is a book cipher that the Nazis were using, which was based on a popular uh, novel of the day about a French governess of the 19th century. It was much better for a spy in South America, a Nazi spy in South America, to be carrying a popular novel that had, a, had the code embedded in it than to be carrying a code book. Because if you get caught with a code book, it looks suspicious. <laughs> but if you get caught with a novel about you know, Henriette de Port, uh, you know, the, the French governess of the 19th century, you're just a, you're just a reader, right? You're just a reader. So, uh, and this is, this is a, one of my favorite documents. This is, in, this is Elizabeth's personal copy, uh, marked up copy of that book cipher that she was using to decrypt these Nazi messages. It's, it's here in the library. I didn't know what it was for a long time, but I, I ultimately realized what it was. Um, 
some other methods of breaking the codes were very familiar to her because um, she and William had used them as Christmas cards before. <laughs> so this is a, a Friedman family Christmas card uh, based on a system called a turning grill. So um, basically you put, you put this piece of paper down over a grid and the holes uh, line with uh, certain letters. I don't, you, you probably have done this before. Um, this was their message one year, and you turn it 90 degrees, and each time you turn it 90 degrees, it reveals a different sort of letters and it makes the message. Well, this is, this is from the secret Co Coast Guard diary, and it's the exact same uh, uh, type of system on the exact same principle. This is a turning girl system that Nazi spies in Brazil were using in 1941 and 1942. All right, I'm gonna go faster. She broke an Enigma sh machine, uh, multiple Enigma machines starting in 1940 with pencil and paper me methods. We can talk about that if you want. Um, this is one of her work products, uh, Decrypt. This is the coin of the realm. This was the decrypted message, Nazi message, that would get circulated through the Allied intelligence agencies. Um, the FBI later took credit for all of this, but you can see from the markings in the National Archives that the originals are with the Coast Guard and that the SIS, which was their special intelligence unit, FBI special intelligence unit in South America, would make a duplicate and then they would file it under their own filing system. Absolutely devious, bureaucratic move. Because <laughs> it, made, it made it seem like the FBI was, was doing the original decryptions when it was really Elizabeth and her team. Okay, and I just wanted, sh this is, this is, I think this is cool, I think because this shows you the similarity in what Liz Elizabeth was doing during the Prohibition period and during the, the hunt for Nazi spies. These are the, um, the, on the left is the Consolidated Exporters RUM radio network on the West Coast. On the right is uh, Berlin. Uh, the clandestine radio stations that were communicating with Berlin from South America that Elizabeth lit up. This is one of the Nazi baddies that, uh, that she brought to ruin, a guy named Johannes Siegfried Becker. Spoke about 47 different languages and he had grotesquely long fingernails that curled like the talon of a bird. He's back up. All right. Um, that didn't quite translate. Okay, so one of the important things that she discovered, I'm, again, I'm gonna do this really quickly, is that uh, the Nazis had uh, formed a, a secret alliance with uh, uh, Argentinian <coughs> intelligence. This is Juan uh, Perón, yeah, and uh, uh, Eva Perón. Uh, they, were, uh, they were working behind the scenes with uh, the same Nazi spies that Elizabeth was tracking um, to try to create a block of fascist countries in the southern part of South America that would resist America and Britain. They actually had some success. They managed to install a fascist leader in Bolivia in 1943. He was later dragged into the street by his people and hung from a lamppost. Um, some of the messages that, that she decrypted from these Nazi circuits, some of them were very anodyne. This is a message from a, a Nazi spy's grandmother in Germany to the spy in South America reminding him to uh, brush his teeth. Uh, but there was also a lot of uh, information of real military importance. This is uh, a report from a Chilean gunnery sergeant who was invited to a U.S. Navy gunnery school and, and uh, reported back on all the details about sort of Navy ballistics for the Reich. Uh, and they didn't, they didn't suspect that um, anyone was reading what they were writing because by 1943 they were using Enigma machines. Elizabeth had broken them. They didn't know that. They didn't think that it was possible for anyone to break an Enigma machine. So they were... Uh, incredibly detailed in their messages, even listing like the full code names of their Argentinian uh, collaborators and uh, even their finances down to the peso. This is really quickly, uh, they collaborated with Bletchley a little bit. I know that there are probably some people in the audience who will have questions about Bletchley, the Bletchley Park aspect of this. Um, there was uh, a team at Bletchley that was working on these same sorts of spy ciphers and there was a little bit of a friendly competition with the Elizabeth and her Coast Guard unit. Um, There's a message, a secret cable uh, from the Coast Guard to Bletchley that they had solved one of the enigmas called Red. Uh, and then a couple of days later, they sent along the, the wheel uh, positions, the wheel wiring, and uh, the British wrote back, uh, don't worry about it, we, all, we just solved this ourselves. So. <laughs> this, uh, we, got all, we got it covered. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, through all of this work that Elizabeth did, um, the the relationship between, the secret relationship between the Nazi Reich and the Argentinian intelligence services was completely broken, uh, which was very bad for both countries and good for the allies. Um, this ultimately led to uh, the dissolution of what the Nazis considered to be their last neutral bulwark in the West, their relationship with Argentina. The spy rings were all destroyed and um, 
1944, they were out of commission, thanks to what Elizabeth did. So why don't we know the story? This is a, kind of a cool story. Um, Code-breaking Quaker poet hunts Nazis. Uh, I, I, I would have wanted to know that story in school. Um, but uh, there are a couple of reasons. One is that it was secret for a long time and classified. And the other reason is Jagger Hoover. So Hoover, after the war, went on a, an intentional publicity blitz. And he, he, he very explicitly took credit for all of the work that Elizabeth and the Coast Guard did that he was incapable of doing at the beginning of the war and needed them to do, uh, claimed that the FBI did it themselves. This, this, is, uh, this is in the, the martial archive. Uh, a, a popular magazine article that Hoover wrote himself by Jager Hoover, how we did this cool, amazing thing, um, that was really misleading, but it, it worked. Um, the result of all this is that the FBI got the credit and the glory and expanded their empire, and Elizabeth got fired. This kind of thing continued uh, almost until the end of her life. This is uh, after William died. She received a literal woman card from the Cosmos Club, a private men's club that he had belonged to in DC, allowing her privileges of visiting the club for a period of a year. So I don't want to end on a down note. Um, Elizabeth did get her revenge, and it was, it was the revenge of a librarian. It was a very quiet but savage revenge. Um, <laughs> And uh, the revenge has everything to do with this place, which is, I think, part of the reason why it's so special, um, is that um, she and William, before William died, they worked together on creating this archive, the, the William Friedman collection. She was devoted to him and was doing it for him to preserve his legacy. But um, sneakily, um, she also included some items in William's collection that spoke about the duplicity of the FBI and um, Hoover's lies. And they're, 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 they don't cry out, but they are sort of like little shards of glass that she's stuck in <laughs> that can still draw blood years later. And um, that's part of the reason I was able to find all of this. It's not that I discovered anything or dug anything up. It's, you know, the archivists here have, have done such an amazing job curating these, these files. It's, it's just that, um, Elizabeth was very modest and, uh, and, like I said, kind of sneaky, but she did insert these, these, these few little things. She tried to write her memoirs and abandoned them, but she did leave a, a four-page sketch that, uh, that kind of led to a couple of clues that are important. And this is, the one, this is the one line in this entire building that I was able to find that talks about uh, what she actually did during World War II, but I think it's one of the coolest. It was in an interview about William's work. Uh, that one of the, I believe one of the librarians here in the 1970s was interviewing Elizabeth. And, um, and she was talking about his work and she just had this sort of like beautiful aside. And she said, the spy, that's what I did, the spy stuff. <laughs> right. All right. So she ultimately, she ultimately got, got her revenge. And, um, and so now we can uh, restore her, her legacy, her achievements, her accomplishments, and give her the place in uh, history that she richly deserves. Thank you so much. That was really fun.